Welcome back to the Contacts Coaching Podcast. We are joined today by TJ Ewing, head football coach, physical education teacher, and strength coach at Monterey Trail High School in Elk Grove, California. Coach, thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to get on this thing at nine o'clock at night and record with us. Appreciate you having me. I'm, I'm excited. I've been waiting for a while for this. Uh, coach Man Freddie's been been pushing me for about a year to get this one done. So uh, let's just dive right in. If you could take us through your background as a coach, how did you end up in the profession? And um, what was the process for you landing your first job? And then uh, any subsequent jobs to where you are now? Can you talk us through kind of that journey? Yeah, I, uh, I was in my third year playing college football at Eastern Washington University. And I really didn't have an idea what I wanted to do in terms of uh, my uh, my degree and my profession. So I was really focused on my craft, trying to be the best football player I could be. Um, taking class, I enjoyed school and, and all that stuff too, but they kind of pinned me down third year because the NCAA rule was you had to be 75% completed your degree by your third year or they would pull your scholarship. Mm -hmm. So they kind of told everybody you had, to, you had to step up or step out. And so I um, was asked by a counselor, you know, I was like, hey, what do you want to do? And I said, I don't know. And she's like, well, um, what do you love? And then I started thinking about all these things in my head. And then she says, um, who's impacted you? That was a really big one. That kind of like took me back. And I was like, my coaches. And I started thinking about all the sports teams I played as a kid. I was a three sport athlete in football, basketball, baseball as a kid. So I kind of drew all the mentors I've had in my life that really, really, I really believe saved me with my family and just, you know, people that mentored me and, and, and helped me with my process. So I figured, they said, well, my school that I didn't know at the time, I didn't know that Eastern Washington was a big teacher school. Mm -hmm. It actually, that was, that was basically built up to be, it was a teacher school in the beginning. They built up through the process of being a state college to a university. So I just found that out. And, um, and so it was really good educational program they had for teachers. And so I, I said, well, I'll be a teacher. And they're like, what subject? And I felt like, well, I like history. I was always interested in history through sports and all that. So I was like history. And then I kind of, um, they were like, you know, what else? And I started thinking about my P teachers I loved as a kid growing up and had a lot of admiration for my elementary school P teacher, my middle school P teacher, and it really uh, just really impacted me. So I got into that realm. So I was both kind of dueling those two, and then I kind of pushed it more towards the phys ed side, and I got my degree in P. So that's how I started um, the process of just being a P teacher. And the coaching gig came through um, being a GA and then, then being a high school coach and meeting uh, Coach Hook in, in, in Lewis Clark High School in Spokane, Washington. And he is the one that taught me the Veer offense and the defensive philosophy we have and all the special teams. Everything we teach kind of runs off his idea through the high school program. And um, and then obviously I, I have been mentored by many coaches in all sports, those three sports I said, those three main sports. So I've taken pieces of ideas from everybody I've been around. So I try to, I call it one big blanket of, uh, of knowledge of people just, you know, from little league baseball coach to pot Warner football coach to my, my middle school basketball coach holding us accountable about times, you know, like saying, like, I remember as a kid, my middle school basketball coach was like, Hey, you got to make a six minute mile or you're not making the basketball team. And I was a little chubby short guy. And <laughs> I was like, really a time that says you have to make it. There's no other way. We're not going to, have any other talk about maybe if I drove my left hand better, <laughs> try to get, you know, if I get around this, he was like, nope. And the cool part about the standard was it wasn't like he was just saying, Hey, you got to do this now. And I'm out of shape. He let us go through it during our PE class. Every Friday was like challenge Friday. And we were trying to beat our best. So when I had to go through that process, um, you know, that was the first time I really got true, like accountability, like standards, like, you have to make this time. And I made the time, but I worked my tail off all year to get that um, time. And I ran with the fast guys. I learned it's like run with the fast guys, use their wind, you know, and <laughs> yep. stay, you know, stay behind. I find these guys run like 530. So I, I stayed behind and got a 545 and I made it. And, but I mean, it was like, like I said, all those, all those experiences, you know, um, Ed Brown, the little league coach at, for the little league A's team I played for. Um, he was a phenomenal a role model. Steve Sell is now the current coach at Aragon. He's a, a, he's a, mm -hmm. He coached me when he was 15 years old on mm -hmm. that same little league team. So mm -hmm. I've known him my whole life. I've known him my whole life. And so all these experiences, all these coaches all 
brought me to my profession and what I do currently. So I was kind of, um, but I really wanted to work with at-risk kids. That was kind of my big deal coming out of Eastern. I yep. working at risk because that's why I started. And I got the job at uh, Peninsula High School, which is a continuation school. And that was my big deal. I really wanted to work with at risk kids and help uh, students of need. And uh, that was my passion. I want to work with them. And I got that job and I, I love that position. But then I figured I could probably do more if I was at a comprehensive school and work with more students. That was kind of when I got into the coaching to be the head coach. And I never really ever envisioned myself to be a head football coach. It's never my passion to be that way. I figured. If I was even going to coach football, I'd probably do the like a line coach and have a team within the team and that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but I never really wanted to be a head coach, no. So interestingly enough, you never wanted to be, but here we are. And it leads me to wonder, what did you learn when you first became a head coach that you needed to figure out in order to be the head coach, right? Because you never wanted to be. You thought you'd just kind of be a position coach. And then the way the world works, you kind of fall into certain things. What did you realize right away that you had to figure out as the head coach versus being a position coach? Well, you definitely have to take on um, a responsibility and accountability to the families of the children you're going to coach. <laughs> you know, you're the, you're the main guy and speak to all the parents, take all the, uh, the conversations. And uh, that was one. But also the thing that the thing I think was big about being the head coach that I learned about being a coach and going to the head coach, I kind of like I, I knew I had to go that journey because I figured it's like it's like the, the rules of how you approach the day go through you. You're the head coach. So you have the opportunity to set the tempo and the and the program's uh, vision and where the where the boat's gonna go in the water. Where are we going? And I really liked that because I was like. There's a lot of philosophies that I grew up with that I that I was around that I really wanted to uh, stick and give the opportunity to for kids to uh, learn. There's a lot of things I really appreciated. I learned from my coaches in the past, and there's things that were that were not getting done that I thought I would like to give students that opportunity mm-hmm. that I didn't really get chances at times. I felt like, man, I really would like to have, you know, these students have that opportunity. So, for example. Uh, like we'll, we'll go for like, there'll be like a two point conversion or some big, huge play in the game that everybody deems big and huge. And, and I'll have my players, they'll, they'll huddle up and I'll say, what do you guys want to run? Mm-hmm. You know, and they'll, and they'll, and they'll, and they'll have total power on that call. And we've won games and we've done things and the kids have called that play, you know, and mm-hmm. it's, it's never about me. It's about the kids. And I always felt like that's kind of why the head coaching position is really appreciated because giving those kids the power even even positions you know like what kids want to play which is they play all that kind of stuff I really like to give kids the power of um, you know of choice to do that because I feel like when the kids have that power they'll play for each other more like I know like for example we there's sadly enough the kids get hurt sometimes time to time they'll get hurt and you know kids laying there and you know we try to you know console them and and I'll turn to the kids and I'll say, who do you guys want on the field? You know, and the kids will be like, I want Johnny. And I'll be like, okay, Johnny, let's go. And I know, you know, maybe in the back of my mind as a coach, you know, evaluating kids, you're like, oh, this kid's, you know, skill set isn't as good as another kid's or whatever you want to say. But what I found in the past is that all the kids will play harder for that other kid. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't matter if the kid has a different, like, I, I'm not good with my left hand, right hand, whatever. The other kids start stepping up for him. And that's what I've seen in the past. Like uh, giving those kids those opportunities really makes a big difference. And I just, I just love those stories. That's my favorite thing about coaching is the stories the kids come back where they go, we did that. Like we had the power we wanted. And I guess that's from my background in baseball where like the thing I really, I really um, admired, appreciated when I grew up in my, in my 70, 80 era is like um, I could, as a catcher in baseball, I could call my pitches for my pitcher. Hmm. I got the pitches. And so I could literally, I went out to the mound. I would tell the pitcher, Hey man, throw the ball in my glove. Man. What are you doing? I would, I would have conversations with the pitcher about, you know, the accountability of, you know, I told you to throw a curveball right now. <laughs> yep. Like I got to, I got to leave. Yep. And I think it's sad. I sad. I hear that the AU now they're like, you know, in every high level they're all oh, they call, call the pitches on. I'm like, but then we lose the opportunity for leadership, you know? Yeah. And I think I got to do that stuff when I was a kid with point guard in basketball, run my own plays. Mm-hmm. Um, all that stuff. I played all those positions. I got to be a pitcher in baseball, catch baseball, 
I got to be a point guard in basketball. I had those kind of opportunities that um, I didn't play quarterback because I was too slow, as the coach said. <laughs> I dropped back, and he said, go to left guard. <laughs> That's funny. Well, let me ask you this, Coach. Let me ask you this. Uh, how soon in your coaching journey – did you adopt that approach? Is that something that came over time or is that how you took the reins right away? Um, right away in certain levels, like in terms of like, like giving the kids the, uh, the power to do things in terms of uh, ownership of like cleaning the weight room, cleaning the locker room up, you know, all those things started, it started just flying off the handle because you start seeing like these options and opportunities for leadership. And then you've seen how the kids, they were just wanting it. They really wanted to, needing it for sure, but wanting even more to be the leaders and take control of their own destiny and journey. Um, that's, it's just, it's, it's, I know for us coaches, we're control freaks. That's what, that's what makes a coach in that regard. But I just feel like there's times, there's a time and place for both to happen. And, uh, and there's also a level I talked to um, older coaches have been around for a lot more years than I've ever been around like 40, 50 years in the, in the business. And I talked to those guys and they always talk about, you know, um, you know, letting those kids have those op opportunities. And then also um, they say, like, even if, even if make them feel like they made the made decision, even if you're making a decision for them, they, they feel like they had the opportunity to make the rules. Right. So, so as much as people go, man, you got, you know, your kids, they really work hard and this and that and the other. And I always tell them, I said, well, the kids made the, made the accountability. They're the ones that came up with the idea. I didn't come up with that idea about, reminders and you owe and all that stuff like that's all from the kids and it, and it changes every year it changes every year yeah it changes it really does change every year each so, team changes you know well 100 percent. and i think it's interesting that you said that you know kind of right away you figured that out because ultimately uh you know we have to get to a place in our coaching careers where we have enough confidence wherewithal security i guess is the right word that we're willing to give that power away, right? And I'm glad for people listening to hear that you can lean into that and see the transformation in those kids that makes you then want to actually give away more, which I think is super helpful because the whole point of this pod was to help coaches who are stepping into a leadership role to have some ideas and other things like that. So if I could push back a little bit and say, okay, you – have found value in giving your kids agency and opportunity and leadership. How do you do that practically? Can you give three to five things that you've done that work that somebody else could adopt and, and, and try on their own? Let me think. Um, yeah. I mean, if, if we, we like to try to start off early in the, in the process of putting them in teams so they have a leadership opportunity. So a kid leads and they're able to uh, have different uh, segments of, of, our, of our day, whatever daily activity we're doing. They have segments of their leadership it has to be, you know, a certain group of guys they have to work with. And so we, we have them pick teams and we have them like, you know, identify who they're, who they're leading. And I think that's kind of cool. Like, especially like we're in off season, like right now we're in off season and kids have, uh, we have like, we picked, you know, seven captains for seven guys, and some 49 guys, big football program. And you're like, you know, the kids have to go through various things. So we try to attach all things school-wise into their, 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 their team points. And we really try to make the most kooky, funny stuff that you could think that wasn't important. We make it important. You know, we make, give an so example, give an example. Um, I mean, go, go, obviously let's say, make it real simple. Like going to a sport event, or going to a dance, or going to a uh, rally, or going to a, uh, or being a part of Link Crew, or being part of Honor Society, or going to like a help help the homeless, feed feed the, you know, the needy. All that stuff gets put in the pot of points given, like community service and like that's all points given to the teams. So teams are like out there. It's hilarious because teams are out there. They're really going for it, and they and they'll ask us, Coach, if we do this, do we get you know? And so they're out there. So they're they're. I won't say that. I don't want to use the word distracted. Because you know, obviously, when they're no, they're sport, competing. Like, they're trying yes. to get. They're trying to win yes. in whatever the game yes. you created is. Yes, absolutely. And they're trying to win. They're trying to find ways to win. They'll Facetime. They'll take pictures. They'll photo what they're doing. They'll get everything they can to make sure they're getting over um, in in the, the competition because they're trying to be first place. And uh, 
it's funny. We do a lot of rankings. We do a lot of rankings, a lot of, uh, we have, everything's like ranked out and kids know where their position and we put it out there. And, um, you know, I think that's something that's good to do too. If you're, you know, if you're into strength conditioning and that kind of stuff, like having points, I know Boyd Epley in Nebraska was real big on that when he's at Nebraska, they're really good about having points and rankings and yeah. um, learning, learning, getting, finding your captains, you know, having the players pick captains. It's my big thing. I'm not a big fan of picking captains at all. I never, ever liked that as a player that the coach would pick the captains. I really feel like they have no idea of the student because I think we're, we're all, when we play ball in front of our adults we play for, we all pull a little Eddie Haskell. You know, we do a little Eddie Haskell, leave it to Beaver. You know, we all kind of fake a little bit in front of our coach. We're not really being honest. And so when they're around the corner, you know, Johnny knows Bobby around the corner. They know how Bobby really acts. Or he say Eddie, Eddie Haskell, right? You know, it's like, yeah. so he kind of, I believe the players know each other more than I do. And yeah. I value their opinion on the process than I would. So how do you do that? What is your process for selecting captains? Because I don't even have them on my basketball team because I, I feel like it gives the other athletes permission not to lead. And I want them all to lead. Um, and so I totally get what you're saying. How do you go about your process of having the athletes select their leaders? Oh, uh, it's, it's, it's a yearly thing. Cause like I said, we do so many different uh, activities to build that opportunity. We have so many things We're we're really big for us. We're really big on multiple sports, multiple a- activities, AP classes. We push all like, it means almost like, to be honest, it's almost like the same idea the academies do. You look mm-hmm. at how the academies are so crazy. If you're, if you ever take time to look at, the admissions process to academies. I mean, I think we're pretty close to getting to what they do on that point system to get into the academy. Right. And I was watching that the other day. I was like, geez, this, this looks like we do with our kids because what they've developed, what the kids have developed over the years of wanting more and more and more to try to pass up their peers. Mm-hmm. Um, that's why, that's what I'm saying about, um, you know, it's, it's uh, a little disheartening missing school the time for the COVID thing. Cause like, we're trying to build that back, that tradition yeah. of the captainship. And so we use that as a vehicle for the kids to see each other in a way that goes, yes, that's a guy who went speaking for us. And we talk as the captains talk to the referees for the game. Cause we have to have captains. I think, I think we have to, cause they always ask, Hey, who are your captains? And I go, I don't know. Who we'll ask our players? <laughs> yeah, no, it's the same way, right? In basketball, it's like, what is the formal responsibility to go have a 30 second conversation with the refs? But yeah, it goes so far far beyond that in the, in the way in which you empower your kids to lead sounds like the trickle down effect is much more impactful on your culture than just that surface level oh these are the dudes that talk to the ref so with that I'm curious because it, it you've already kind of answered this but I wonder if there's something that maybe you wanted to add but if I were to ask you what's the best thing you do in your program that you've either stolen or you've implemented that has the largest ripple effect on creating the culture you want. Is it this competitive point scheme or is there other things that you think are super valuable that if you were to leave, you would take with you? Um, I think the overall, the overall um, identity of what a Mustang is in terms of the three sport athlete, the AP class, the point system, the strength conditioning, all those things combined create what we call a must commitment level of kids showing up and, and showing out when they're there, you know, and we haven't, we have, and that's the thing I, I learned. And this is a good coaching piece for all the coaches out there. That are, they're trying to be co- head coach or whatever. It's like the more you do with the kids and the more they have to be there, identify your captains. That's all I would say. Like you have to do more practices to get out your culture, what you want. You cannot, um, go halfway with that. You have to be all in on your time commitment because when they show up to everything you have to do, and that goes back to family, man. It's tough. It's tough on people. They they want to take this journey. You want to be a coach. And I know Bob Ladder said, De La Salle said, you know, he's, he would say he would be exhausted after practice because he'd be so inundated in his focus on getting the best out of the kid. It's like, that's hard on you. That's not easy. You get totally exhausted from doing that much work but that's what it takes to get the culture driven out of your team to find out who the true leaders are and unless you practice and work that much you'll never know who they really are 
You'll ne- like that's the hardest part when you just come in as a head coach like college ball. I would be just horrific. Like how they change coaches all the time. I would yeah. bet that would be horrific to try to build a culture when you don't even know the person you're talking to in your face. Like how do you know how the team is when you've only been there for a year? Yeah. I mean, three years, four years, you got to be there longer than that to build some type of culture. So I think that's the big thing is like time put in will, will afford itself in, its, in your face through what you do. Like I said, all the things I said earlier, all that stuff happens. And then you do so many days of my, my one coach calls it um, the repetition. He calls it the odometer on a car, like the same thing. How much odometer, how many miles have you put in to really get the crux of what you're trying to get out of? And that's the, the, the culture, what you're trying to teach the, we call it the true Mustang. You know, we're trying to, we're trying to be our mascot, trying to be the true Mustang. And that's just time put in the time put in. And they're doing all these competitive drills and, and things we have that we, we run in our program that we've taken from other people. Like I always like all these years, I always like ask people, like I have, I admire so many coaches, so many people I, I've talked to. Um, and I ask them, like, I really like talk, talk to people I admire. I always say, what's your favorite drill? Mm-hmm. I always ask like the coach, like it'd be like Dean Smith, you know, in basketball, I'd be like, what's your, what's your favorite drill? What's real? Would you? Like Dick told me one time, I talked to Dick told me, the head coach at Arizona for years and passed away. Love that man. He was like such a great, you know, inspiration, but it's like, I asked him, you know, and he says the run show run drill. And so it's like, we always do that drill. That drill's in our program, stapled. Mm-hmm. So I like, so there's like drills in our program. They're like, the, the guys are like, this is their most fantastic, like the most, you know, exciting and kid and you know and what happens is your practices become phenomenal because you have these like you know Pete Carroll says the whole you got to compete you got to have energy your coach got to lead that energy if you have that kind of drill you're going to find out who the leaders are right off the bat because mm-hmm. they're going to they're going to step forward it was like uh Randy Blankenship remember Randy Blankenship the great Randy Blankenship high school coach up in uh, Aptos uh, high school I was a lot of my admiration and respect yep. for him it's like yep. Randy's like I remember Randy saying one time he's like why well, use he goes I use a uh, I use a, a dodgeball game he goes and I and I, and I go and I and I find out who's on offense and on defense off watching the game the kids that are in the front they're on defense they're the aggressive guys they'll throw the ball right at the line the guys in the back they're on offense they're they're thinking about you know how to plot how to you know come up with ideas and I was like you know what that, and that's what I mean like you take all these ideas people you have all these cool drills you're like you'll find out through all that stuff who you're you doing like just today we were. We were doing it one class. I was doing a uh, tire fights. We we're pulling fight. We we're trying to try to pull tires from each other for fun. I usually don't do those maybe to the summertime. And I did them today to see where kids were at and their mindset. And they were like laughing because they were doing it like, ah, I try to, ah, I got you. And and then the yeah. guys look around and they start getting, oh, that's my leader right there. That dude, that's my dude. Yeah. That's Johnny. Johnny fought with his heart. Johnny. Yeah. And then, you know, then, you know, kids go to masters for wrestling or something. They guy, they go, kid goes to the finals for, you know, state qualifier for track or, baseball mm-hmm. players a drafted guy i mean these guys start doing things these kids know that's my dude right there but then there's some kids that just can't talk they're not talker guys they're mm-hmm. not going to talk for the team but they're still the leader of the team but they're not the captain like i told kids I said, look you're maybe not a captain for us in terms of speaking in front of the team but you're sure a captain you know mm-hmm. and, and i said you don't need to be a captain for us because it may take more emotion from you that you don't need to bring that out you need to waste your energy before a game because you're that kind of guy you you get a little too hyped up and a captain is too much for you. That meaning what that represents, but you're still a leader and a captain for our team. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. And I love the way in which you have framed the roles that people play there, the way you just described that. I love the fact that, you know, you mentioned Blankenship, who's right down the road from me. uh, And you gave a really tangible way for people to understand different ways of sussing out leadership and help positions because of where they're playing dodgeball. I think it's great. I want to dial in on something you said at the beginning of that answer was to be a Mustang. You are going to take AP classes. You are going to be a three sports athlete. And what I want to know in a generation that has grown up with the youth sports industrial complex pushing sports specialization on them since they came out of the womb. How do you combat that and sell that message and get buy-in when the outside noise that they're often facing is giving them the exact opposite message? That's the, that's exhausting 
uh, journey that we all coach and teach you how to go through. That's what we have. That's the whole, like, are you willing, are you willing to um, push that energy on that? And I will, I will all the time because I, I, be- I believe in, I full on believe what you learn, like the dodgeball game, you learn that in other sports, you learn the exact same criteria about the process of switching. Like for example, and I, and I don't, and I don't tell kids not to do outside things. They have to come up with that themselves. I let kids go learn that. So for example, I've had kids do seven on seven and all that stuff. And they'll still run track and all that. And then you know what happens? Kid just burns out. He literally just burns out. And he goes, and he, 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 he probably looks at me and goes, I can't do this anymore. I go, I, I don't know. Can you? And they look at me and I can't. And they keep saying, it. I go, well, maybe you got to, you know, think about what you want to do. Maybe you want to drop this, drop that, or whatever, you, wanna, you know, and then they figure it out themselves. And I don't even, I personally don't care what, what they pick because they're still being active. Mm-hmm. They're still being active. But I just know that what ends up happening is they realize, you know, the high school sports, that's where everybody's attention's at. You know, that's, that's still the, that's still the go-to in terms of, radio tv uh newspaper it's the high school sports so even though like all the other sports besides football has gone to the to au club thing because they just don't have that draw of people at their games like football does that way mm-hmm. football still has that draw that that people are going to go to the game and show up in there and i see that's kind of the one factor that um that hasn't switched over yet and if that switch is over where you know like say colleges will be like they do it all their sports hey we're going to meet at this game and you guys got a tournament in arizona we're all going to be there come there if that happens in football and they say like they were trying to do it with combines for a while they tried to do it combines and have the coaches go remember Pete carroll one of his first big recruiting process at usc was the stanford combines that they allowed coaches to go to then two years later when he not monopolized for two straight years on grabbing guys and signing guys from there they they did without it and say took it away yeah. and Pete carroll i give him so much credit for that because i was physically there watching those dinosaurs walk in and he signed, and there were some dudes, and he was so far ahead of guys, very similar to Harbaugh that way, already thinking way ahead before anyone knew the rules, he already knew the rules. Mm-hmm. And that's the genius of those guys, and their, their just ability to uh, be forward thinkers and, and know the rules and know what the land and kind of um, – but I wanted to kind of drop that a little bit. But that's that's kind of the, um, the AU thing. It's like I don't really – I don't tell kids not to play seven on. I don't do that. I don't do that to kids. I don't, and I don't tell them what sport to play either. That's another thing a lot of coaches will do. They'll be like – why did you tell them on track? You know, that's the best thing for them. I'm like, no, I just want to make sure they're, they're with an adult supervision from three to three to five, three to six o'clock mm-hmm. after school, whether it's golf in the spring, baseball. I've had guys play every sport in the spring and winter. I've had them play. I mean, golf, men's volleyball. I've had big, tall kids do men's volleyball. Never done their life. And then they get real good because they're very athletic. They can jump. They get real good at it quick. And so and we tell them tennis. I'm like, one of my linemen is a tennis player. I've got a lineman be a golfer i'm mean, one of the right now <laughs> golfing. yeah absolutely get to the ball you know and anticipate and then one kid pushing to like be a number two maybe number one he's never played got tennis his life and i'm like good for him you know he's a competitive kid he's figuring out how to compete yep let me ask the follow-up on that then because you mentioned it early i was a football basketball baseball guy and you are pushing the multi-sport athlete approach out there and and that's a big soapbox of mine where in my own household, there's only two non-negotiables, which are you're playing three sports a year and you're going on the uh, 11-day backpacking trip when you're a sophomore. Anything else, I don't really care. Um, but the reason <laughs> being how you explained it, right, you, that you learn things in these other sports and these other endeavors that translate and carry over to life. How have you observed the other sports your kids are playing or the um, coaches that you work with that coach the other disciplines and stolen or uh, appropriated, adopted uh, things from non-football disciplines and use them in your own practices. Can you speak about that a little bit and and things you've been able to steal by watching other sports? 100% volleyball. I learned about water. I learned about how you can only, you can have water, Water available at drills. You don't have to waste any time water breaks. So literally you can grab the water, drink it, throw it to the side, and just keep repping. And you have the no, we have no water breaks in our practice. Learn that from volleyball. Wrestling, wrestling, uh, lowering your level. Words, words I use for, for physical movement. So lowering your level, telling kids, hey, to lower your level. Uh, bend your knees and ankles. 
um, hand, hand, hand placement, things that wrestling coaches talk to their players and are combating and doing different moves on the mat. I've used that verbiage into football drills. Um, I can't, I can't think about basketball uh, just in my head. I think about, well, that's, there's a lot that's of basketball perfect. Stuff. Just really quickly. And, and the reason I asked that question is often, and I, I, I assume you will validate this statement with the people you're around and, and in our circles we often fall into the trap of, well, I can only get better by talking to another basketball coach, or in your case, another football coach. And you just named two very specific things that have nothing to do with football that have made you a better football coach and your kids better players. And so it, it's really about that. Look outside of your echo chamber and there's a lot to be had. And I love those yeah. two examples. They're crisp, they're easy. And if you have any others while you're thinking about it, Track. let me know. Track, track and field, the stances. We our football guys do this track stances. Get out of the, get off the line with more force from low to high. So our track stances are huge. I had one of the track coaches come over and sprint coach. I said, look, I know you don't know about football. I don't care. You do know football. I said, all I want you to do is take take my line guys and see, look at their stances and make sure they're they're in the most powerful, explosive stance they can get out of their stance in. And he would take them over and work their stances it's like track. Same thing in the blocks. Mm -hmm. Exact same. Dance the blocks, explosive movements out of the blocks. And we use that for track and field. So, um, yeah, those, those are all things we've done. Um, I guess anticipating the ball, the tennis and all that, anticipating and, and already knowing where the ball is going to be. Like baseball, that whole uh, cutting, we call it down for the cross, but like cutting guys off and knowing he's going to be there, not there when the ball is snapped, you know, mm -hmm. being able to get the uh, angles of pursuit on people. That's mm -hmm. the whole playing outfield and knowing the ball sit there, running the spot. All that kind of stuff. That's you know, and obviously seeing the seeing the whole court, seeing the vision of basketball, going to see the court. What you want from the positions, like for example, basketball, like you want the point guard because the point guard is always going to see the court from your quarterback. That'd be more mm -hmm. like I've seen quarterbacks that yes, you know, pot quarterbacks you can coach the heck out of them. They can sit in the pocket and, and to figure out how to read the coverage. But essentially, the kids that have their back to it. They do the back to the basket post. Those are your, like, defensive ends, tight ends. They're not really a quarterback. We've had quarterbacks do that, but they weren't really the best at reading because they don't mm -hmm. have to do that when they don't play point guard. Point guards are the guys that have to read off stuff quickly, see the floor, call the play. They're just in demand. They're in, they're in command. They're the leaders. Yep. So my ultimate goal would always be a point guard quarterback. Yep. And I've only really had that. And all my coaching have only been had that maybe twice in our whole time. I and mean, they were – great players yeah. the guys that played point guard they played basketball football you know absolutely let me ask this over the course of how many years you've been at monterey trail i've been there now going to be 18 so 17 going to be 18 now okay so if you think back to year one two year 17 and 18 how has your approach changed um uh, i think you know in the beginning I was very nervous for the school because I was trying to make sure that school got off on the right foot because it's a brand new school. So I really want to make sure I um, put a lot of time into the school to, to develop the culture in the school because we really wanted our school to be the best we could be like every school event. We really want to put our most time into and making sure it's done right. And I got lucky because um, when I got there, we, we got to um, like kind of teach the whole uh, – we have like a school-wide Hey, Coach, program. hold on one second. I got to pause here. I got something going on in the dorm. Give me a sec. And go. Yeah, so the uh, school was new, so I had to, like, uh, build a culture. And so we put a school wide stretching program in, and we really started building a lot of uh, camaraderie with the school and the, and the students with the stretching program that brought in a lot of um, enthusiasm for the school, a lot of rah-rah, cheering, like a rally-type environment in our PE. So it gets the kids all fired up for the school. Like, a, you know, treat, treating kids as, as a scholar athletes. Like, everybody's a scholar, everybody's an athlete. That's what we all – we just say there's levels to it. There's levels to it, but everybody is a scholar athlete. We tell our kids. So that was a philosophy for a statement. I didn't have a lot of on-campus coaches that, that helped within the structure of the overall sports as much. It's most off-campus. Some guys were on-campus are really good teachers, coaches, and they did a great job. But now it's like, for example, on our program, I have, I think, like eight or nine guys on campus now from the middle school to the high school. So it took me that many years to get our guys on because, you know, we're dealing with the California public uh, district where it's uh, tenure, right? So that makes it very difficult to hire people on and off because you have to respect the tenure process. And that takes time to, to work itself out. And, you know, I've, I, we hired a few people that didn't work out, but um, now it's very settled and, and people are there. So I delegate more out to, to coaches 
um, than I had to before because I didn't have the coaches. So there's a lot of things I would call it. I used to call it a one, one coach lesson plan. What, what's your one coach lesson plan? Because if you don't have anyone there, you're all by yourself, what do you do? Because you can't just walk away and quit. <laughs> That's not an option. So you have to figure it out. So I, I've always built a one coach lesson plan where I know like if I was there by myself for months, I could run the practice uh, to the best of my ability. I feel like I would get the most out of the day. That, that's a great term that I'm going to steal. The one coach lesson plan. Love that. Uh, let's wrap up with this. It's something I've been doing for a while now, but it, it comes from a different podcast where the question is, what have you most recently changed your mind on? And it doesn't have to be coaching. It doesn't have to be sports. It could be as a parent. It could be as a teacher. But it's about the growth mindset, right? What do you? What have you thought of? Where? Hey, I used to be really dug in on this particular thing here, and now I'm over here, and here's why. Um, probably having my kids do AU sports. <laughs> I'm not really a big fan, but it just seems to me like it's just harder and harder to compete if you're not getting the repetitions. And I think that I don't really, I don't, I don't like the word comp or, or rec. I would say practice or no practice. That's really what it boils down to. It's like, at the end of the day, you have to get practices in. And if that person's doing it, you got to go there. You got to go get the practice in. You're not going to compete unless you have the repetitions. I understand people are big, strong, and fast. And there's genetics to play with a lot of things in life. But at the end of the day, if you're, if you got the repetitions, the movement, you have an unconscious response. If you have an unconscious response, you're going to play a lot faster, whatever you're doing. So that's where, like, kind of the rubber meets the road with that. Like, if you're lucky enough to have an opportunity where you can participate and you're not having to go everywhere to do it or pay a bunch of money to do it, that would be phenomenal. And I think a lot of coaches' kids get that opportunity because they're able to have facilities sometimes and have those things without having it. But the normal, everyday person, I absolutely respect your process. And, and whatever gets kids out of trouble – and they have mentors, good mentors to be around. I'm 100% on board with that. So that's where I've kind of changed. We've always been like a AAU, you know. <laughs> I was always like that, but I kind of changed my ways on that. Well, I think if I hear you right, it's about the repetitions, where I think what sours high school coaches like you and I on quote-unquote AAU or club sports is what's being bundled into it from the organizational standpoint or the coaching standpoint of we're chasing scholarship or if you play with us, this will happen where what you're saying is it's a vehicle to get more reps. And I think I'm a hundred percent on board with those endeavors from that lens. Like let's find a way to get more reps, to get competition. I'm super sour and salty about it when it's being sold as a bill of goods to this is your only path or if you don't do this then x and i think that's where at least i run into the the discomfort or the distaste with it and i don't it sounds like you're saying something similar yeah no i i think it's just it's just the thing is because you're because you're trying to do something that acts it's like for example it'd be like if somebody became an electrician had absolutely no background in electrician like you're teaching pedagogy yeah, you're, you're, it's pedagogy. You don't have any background in it. You think you can do it, and it, and then people do it anyways because the kids are fantastic. Mm -hmm. The kids are the ones that are doing it. You're getting the best and the brightest. Mm -hmm. It's like an AP class where they you can just the class runs itself because you have the best and the brightest to teach the class itself. So I just feel like that's the only rub with that would be just like you know who's teaching it, what's your background in it, and education. You know, have you have you done anything in that regard? Taking time to learn how to teach. And all that kind of stuff. So that's that's where it's that's where it's kind of different, I think. And that's what goes. But again, kids have to have a place to play, and they'll find anywhere. And and my one good friend, Ricky Curry, known for millions of years, and uh, he always says, you know, when we were that age, we probably would have played. And, <laughs> and I was, and I go, yeah, you're right. I'd probably played seven on. Because you know, it's just you're a competitive person, so you're going to you want to compete with the best and brightest. And uh, so, I, I, like I said, I definitely changed my mindset on that stuff. So. I love that answer. And I appreciate you being transparent and sharing that. And I think there's a lot of wisdom in that. And uh, I want to let you get back to the family. It's late. Appreciate you coming on. Thanks for being here tonight. And uh, looking forward to letting this out there for the world. Hey, thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it.